Next up is um, Dr. Rick Chalaternik from University of Alberta. He's going to talk about the Equistor project. And, uh, and a long ways away from geomechanics. Um, I know you said you're going to hear about geomechanics, but this is, this is a long ways from geomechanics. Well, no, I might, I might throw in thermal induced fracturing just because it re says something. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to speak today. Um, so I think for this, this presentation, um, let me just jump right to it, uh, really has to do uh, with the world of, of CCS and the challenges. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about the sort of Alberta landscape and the, and the crazy wild west that is occurring for CCS in, in Alberta. And, and some of the challenges that have come up about um, the questions we need to answer uh, around CCS and some of the challenges. And so we've spent a long time with Aquastore Aquastore project talked about it last. Uh, uh, Eric mentioned about salt precipitation. Somebody wants to see the video. I can show you the video on salt crystals. Looks like from your outer space and all that kind of stuff. But um, what I what I really wanted to talk about today or share with with everybody some thoughts about how we're trying to use data from Aquastore to look at this this magical mythical number that's been used called the efficiency factor. And uh, if many of you don't know what the efficiency factor is, I'll talk to you a, a bit. And, uh, so I, and, and by the way, to preface this a little bit with everybody, all of the hard questions go to Shima, by the way. Thing. There's a poster. Um, I'm going to deny everything. And, uh, and Shima's, Shima's has all the answers, are, and we'll be, we'll be getting more answers. Um, so this is kind of this ma magical formula that everybody has used in Atlas uh, projects around the world uh, to go on and look at certain basins, you know, look at what is the capacity targets for us for storage, and you have a, n a, a bunch of numbers that you see across here that has this, this, this magical mass of CO2 that I'm going to inject in the subsurface, and it has a bunch of stuff, the geologists in the crowd will know this, net to gross and the thing, and the, you know, do a porosity calculation, and all that kind of stuff, and a, an effective uh, porosity, and a total porosity, and all the numbers, and you do all the stuff, and the density CO2, and then you get to the sort of the end, and you get a magical E number. Um, and this magical E number is controlled by a bunch of stuff, and eventually you get to this point where you get an efficiency factor. And if you're looking for a rule of thumb, everybody picks, you know, oh, 5%, something like that. Right? And actually, it, it's usually a very accurately picked number for some odd reason. You see an efficiency factor is 2.65%. Um, so anyway, it gets, and, and you downgrade uh, the sort of large scale calculation about what the capacity is for your unit. So, um, so why the context for this? Well, it drove this particular map. So this is Alberta. The light blue regions that you see there are all appraisal project locations in Alberta that have um, been given to companies. So there's 26 of them now, 25 essentially, uh, chasing uh, subsurface targets for uh, the development of basically commercial storage hubs for CO2. Um, and so Quest, of course, is the very famous project. It's the very first one in Alberta. You can see it there. Um, uh, but it's surrounded now um, uh, by a whole bunch of other projects going after primarily a basal Cambrian sandstone unit. Uh, but there are a bunch of brave souls uh, to the left uh, in, in, in Alberta, to the, to the west side of Alberta, that are going at shallower carbonate targets, uh, NISCU reef uh, shelf margin reef structures and things like that, which is, you know, sort of pushing the boundaries a little bit of, of what you do. Um, and, and so inside these, there has been for the commercial applications, and whether I do or I do not want to become a commercial hub operator, is the calculation of capacity. So if I look at something like um, on that list, and some of you may not be able to see it at the scale, try to blow it up as much as that, number four. That's the next legacy of Shell called Atlas. So in that particular case, in, in Atlas, um, it, it's going to have a much higher injection target than Quest. To the right of that is co something called the Pathways Alliance, which is about the oil sands production. Uh, uh, capture CO2 in the oil sands, bring it down by pipeline down to the number 18 region, Cold, Re Cold Lake region, um, inject very large volumes. If you think Gorgon in Australia is big, um, it's, it's, not even, it's not even half the size of what they're planning for pathways. But all of this is buried or predicated on a capacity estimate. I needed to take that area, do all that fancy math, do everything else, multiply by 2.65%, and come up to say that if I have an emitter who's going to supply me CO2 at a rate of 2 to 3 megatons per year, 5 megatons per year, for 25 years, yep, I got enough capacity. 
come on down, off we go. Um, it doesn't, not quite that simple. Um, so, so what I wanted to do was we said, okay, well, let's look at Aquastore. I'm going to try and paint a picture. This is going to be a tough audience to convince, I think, but I'm going to try. Um, is that we have eight years of dynamic data injection at Aquastore and one of the few projects under real CO2 injection that's done multiple time-lapse 3D seismic surveys to interpret the position of the, CD, the CO2 plumes. And we said, well, okay, if, if we history match to that data, we have all the dynamic data, history match to all that data, history match to the seismic conversion on the CO2 plumes, then I know where the CO2 went. Yeah, I know, a few of you are thinking, yeah, really. But, but that's a position we're going to take. So I actually know where that mass of CO2 sits in Aquastore. So can I go in reverse and tell what the efficiency factor was? So instead of making it up on the far end, can I actually take the mass of CO2 and know which phi it sits in in Aquastore and actually extract efficiency? That's the premise. Um, and Aquastore is kind of important, actually, for this particular reason, for a lot of reasons, for a lot of projects, is that we're only at about 0 0.55, 0 0.6 megatons. By the time, yeah, the end of the year comes, by the time the fifth seismic comes, it will be about probably 0 0.6. Um, but then there's this transition to 5.5 megatons and 55 megatons, large-scale commercial projects that you have to worry about. And so there's some really valuable lessons that can come from understanding that early performance, that sort of 0.55, uh, about trying to see how you get there and, you know, that early dynamic data, uh, history matching to your models and so on. So we think there's, there's a lot there to help us uh, understand that. Um, in Alberta, um, there are significant requirements and I should say, uh, Eric, you want to exclude Alberta from your um, sort of blanket statement about pressure because pressure interference is a huge thing in Alberta and it's written directly into the regulations. Uh, they, they know that's going to happen in those blue regions. Um, and you actually have to demonstrate the impact of your interference both on uh, adjacent hub sites as well as adjacent hydrocarbon resource sectors. It's a, it's a part of your application, like a big part, and it's challenging actually. But uh, again, the reason why capacity conversation today is that this is a requirement for you. In your application to get a sequestration license um, uh, agreement in Alberta, just even to the ability to eject CO2, none of those blue regions do by the way, only Quest, um, you actually have to have a storage capacity estimate. And I should say that, that in fact, the, the more business-oriented issue with the st storage capacity estimates, let's see if I, I, I think, where am I got it? Okay, yeah, it's, it's good. Let me take a couple seconds and explain the landscape in Alberta, why this is important. Because it's not Quest anymore. And I should, and I, I apologize that I don't quite understand portals because I don't know if it's all one happy big family, but I don't think so because in, in now what's happening is instead of it being a fully integrated project I, um, like Quest, there are capaci or capacity, there are capture entities that are a single business unit and the guys doing the storage hub are a second business unit. They're not one big happy family anymore. The guy doing the storage hub is a commercial entity, Androceto Storage Incorporated. I'm, I am capital power. I'm the guy wanting to spend two and a half billion dollars on a natural gas conversion uh, of a coal-fired power plant and put in capture. So now I'm the board of directors at the capital power guys trying to make a decision, corporate decision to spend two and a half billion dollars today and generate a commercial arrangement with Androceto Storage Incorporated for the next 30 years for my uh, four, three to four megatons per year. And so I, we now have to come to a business arrangement. But for me today to spend two and a half billion dollars, Andrew Cito Storage Incorporated has to guarantee me storage capacity estimates of four megatons per year for 30 years. I need 120 megatons. Andrew Cito in Storage Incorporated does not have until 2029 to tell me about the 120 megatons. He needs to drill one appraisal well today, do an injectivity test for seven days, because Andrew's cheap, right? 
He does not want to spend more than five bucks. I am not drilling appraisal wells like crazy. I'm drilling one appraisal well. I'm going to take some core. I'm going to do some testing. And he's cheap, so he's only doing one injectivity test in this large reservoir for seven days. And he's going to do his pressure transient analysis. And he is going to sign on the dotted line for 120 megatons of storage. Yeah, I don't think Andrew's going to sign. It's going to be tricky. So this issue about how do you make this estimate of 120 megatons to convince me as, a, as, a, as, as an emitter to go with Andrew Seed of Storage Incorporated, that's a challenge. That's the landscape. That, it's, a, it's a difficult landscape. Right today, the full conversation today, it's, a, it's, it's affecting everything that's happening. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Susan, su su <laughs> Susan, <laughs> maybe Susan Storage Incorporated, I guess, instead. Um, um, Okay. <laughs> um, so a bit of background on, on Aquastore. So um, it, it's linked to the SAS Power's capture. Uh, you know, it's one of the very first uh, um, coal-fired power plants that converted in the world to, 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 to capture, but it sells most of its uh, CO2 off to Weyburn for CO2 EOR. Um, but like all these projects, it needs buffer capacity, so it drilled a well and an observation well and roughly 500 tons, th three, 400 tons per day kind of number. It's not, you know, it's not massive. Um, but it comes and goes. It's one of the values. Dynamic injection, by the way, this, the comment was people are talking about before, yeah, do not shut in your wells. <laughs> Please don't shut in your wells. I mean, just dribble CO2 in if you have to because if the energy lesson that come from Aquastore is that pff, shutting in wells is not, not good. Um, and we're about 530,000 tons. Um, I will say a, a, a context big issue about this efficiency factor number. So this is a huge study, basal uh, aquifer. It's the aquifer in which CO2 is injected in, in Aquastore. Um, a big study, all of that stuff that you saw, phi, phi effective logs, regional uh, uh, distribution of stuff, everything to do the calculation. And that little white spot where you see the little red arrow in the bottom right-hand side, that came out as white that said, yeah, just do not do storage there because our capacity estimate suggested zero. And that's exactly where Aquastore is. It's exactly where the deep geothermal project is. It's exactly where deep is going to convert to CO2 storage. It's exactly where everything is happening. So 2.65% is a little bit tricky, that number. So just be careful. Um, so site configuration, pipeline, you can see it. You don't have pointers, of course. Red pipeline goes off to the left to, to Weyburn. Um, you know, many of you guys have seen this before, and then there's a wellhead, nothing really fancy, small wellhead, the CO2 comes to it, and, and so on. Um, geology, basal Cambrian sandstones, this has to do not necessarily just with the injection horizon, but you, you know, storage complex is the key word. Um, uh, what you will see on the right-hand side is the kind of stuff I think many people in the room worry about, logs, you know, these days, uh, downhole nuclear magnetic resonance logs for porosity, uh, spectroscopy logs, and so on, all that kind of modern interpretation. There's four gray zones that are four perforation intervals that CO2 go into. And so the thing I'm going to say is that, um, is that in that geometry, in the injection, some zones take CO2, some don't. It affects the CO2 plume position. But I'm going to try and make the argument that we, we kind of know where the CO2 went. So what we did was a, with a lot more expertise in this room, uh, of course, uh, the same kind of stuff that you would see, interpretation, logs, spinners, uh, RST, pulse neutron, logs, all the rest of it, build a model. We use a gem, um, a 1D, 3D mechanical earth models, all the kind of stuff everybody does, matched to really dynamic uh, injection pressure. We, we have to include temperature. Isothermal, I don't think, is something you want to do except maybe at the screening stages anymore. Um, the benefit here is there are four time-lapse seismic surveys. So there's a baseline 2013, no CO2 injected, and then four, all the way 36,000 tons, 100, 150, 207, um, uh, 2,000, and then a, an M5 w will occur here in, in probably three, four months that will be in that over half a million. So out of that comes the, the magic uh, that we know of as seismic uh, interpretation, time-lapse. You say, what color would you like? Um, you, you generate some colors, but, but, you know, I say that sort of sm in a smiling way, but this is not for the faint of heart. And, and this is something, in fact, if people are working in this area, this has kind of been a, an intriguing um, uh, effort, a uh, little sidebar, is that there is a bit of magic to 40 time, si uh, time lapse uh, issues about how you deal with the data sets and align them and so on, the frequency contents, everywhere, the guys are experts. But Don, uh, Don White has been doing this for a long time, Geological Survey of Canada, you can see in the upper right. 
um, uh, really an expert at this, um, was able to extract um, uh, CO2 plume positions uh, over, over these surveys, but I would say that the same data, this is the part that we're gonna, we're gonna look at in our future initiative, the same data given to a company, let's say two years ago, looked at the data and said, yeah, we see nothing, nada. They reprocessed, reprocessed it and everything else and nothing. And there's been quite a bit of a bun fight uh, among that route about how to do this. So this is even not for the faint of heart, but I am gonna make the, the, the pitch that through all of this stuff, we've, we've done this multiple, scale, multiple stage um, um, simulation work to take us to the M4 position by using everything from stochastic distributions to properties to changing the geological model to, to looking at the seismic, uh, seismic inversion and everything else to get to the, to the upper right hand picture of the plume position. Um, and, and so we've, we've sort of, for this capacity number, which is, there's only a few slides here at the end because there's not much to say about efficiency factor, it's, it's not 2.65%, um, is that if we know that, then what does it tell us? So, so if, I, if I go ahead and look at this, um, I would say for the simulation folks, um, it, you know, what we did learn was that, you know, if you didn't do all of this kind of stuff, you can get whatever plume shape you want and still match the bottom hole pressure data. So it's kind of like, what, what kind of plume shape would you like? You, you, can, you, can give them, you can give that to them. But I think we know what it is, or we'll take that position. So we know where the CO2 is positioned in a calibrated geological model uh, petrophysical properties and everything else. So we're gonna use this efficiency factor methodology, assuming that position. We'll just use the USDOE methodology. It's essentially the same as that other plot before, but you know, uh, density of CO2, um, so on, effective porosity and so on, height of the zones. So um, Shima did sort of some of the early heavy lifting on this, said, okay, I'll go back to that calibrated model. I'll look at each of this sort of detailed geological horizons. I'll extract the mass of CO2 out of there. I'll look at how far it goes. I will calculate within each of those geological units what the actual porosity is, what the actual height is. I will do all of those individual calculations and I will extract out an efficiency factor. So if you do that and you look at this, this fairly, this up to April, 20, April 1st, 2020, this is the kind of distribution you get. And you can kind of see that, as you can well imagine, that it's going into the horizons, the sort of higher porosity horizons. Um, and the efficiency factor, if you look at the bottom, can go all the way to that sort of, in the horizon that's taking most of the CO2, which is that second perforation interval, you're, you're looking at an efficiency factor of 50%, and it varies uh, depending on what those units are and the porosities and everything else. Kind of complicated number, but they're very high. It's not 2.65%. You say, well, okay, I'll take an average. So we took an average of all of that kind of stuff and you get 14.1%, still not 2.65. I, I don't know why I'm using 2.65, but it's a number. So, well, okay, I'll look at the, the uh, cumulative distribution. I take a P50 and it's 10%. So you can see that if you start to get down those efficiency factors at 2.5, 2.6%, you're gonna be really low down on the sort of P, P, P10, P20 kind of parts of the curve. Um, so the other issue was, well, what else goes into that calculation? Um, well, one of the other things that goes in the calculation is what is the zone in which you want to calculate? How big, should you do it all the way out to your lease space? Should you do it as big as the plume size? Should you, how, where should you do that capacity estimate? Um, and so if you look at this, there's a couple, we just chose a couple here just to give you a sense. So we have a, um, a sort of um, two and a half, a sort of smaller seismic survey region, that inner blue square that you see there. Um, um, that was for detailed studies, and then an outer five kilometer by five kilometer seismic, um, uh, the 3D seismic range. So, okay, well, that's kind of our boundaries. Let's use that. The other one is, is that you'll see a lot, is you take the plan view and you look at the maximum extent of the CO2 plume, and then you just create a column all the way down. So you look at the maximum extent, but you create this column and you do all of your calculations of phi and H and everything else in that region. So okay, so that's approach one and approach two. I, the displacement factor doesn't matter. So now what I'll do is I can now go back to every single of the, the sort of time domains and match, march through time and look at the difference between approach one and approach two. And if I do that, here's what you get. So uh, there's, four, there's 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 is the time. The upper scale is the efficiency factor for um, approach two. So approach two is the maximum extent of the plume and a column all the way up. 
And approach one is the bottom scale, which is now the seismic domain. So you can see what happens is, is that if I look at the variation now, the blue dots are that 40 to 50% variation over the geological units. The red, because it's much, much bigger, it's averaged or vol you know, volumetrically over this much, you can see that they're not even anywhere near 2.65%. They're down at a half a percent. And that's all based on the premise, okay, it's on the premise that we know where the CO2 went in these early days of the, of the project. We know, we know which geological horizons it sits in. So this is actually really quite complicated. It's, you know, again, it's nowhere near that 2.65%. And it's the number I need with Andrew Cito Storage Incorporated, right? No, not Incorporated. No, Storage Incorporated. Yeah, Storage Incorporated. Um, so you look at approach one and approach two, which is the seismic domain. The red for the seismic domain approach one, the bigger region, it goes up. Blue starts to go down. So now this, the dynamic variation in the efficiency factor starts to play a role, and it's how much you have to include this dynamic data in the, in the data. Um, and say, so, wow, well, it's geologically based, yeah. So this is, the, this is the efficiency factor versus porosity. So I don't know, you have to machine learn this or something, I don't know, but there's nothing there. And you can't, it's very difficult. And that's why all the hard questions to Shima. This is, this is the future for Shima, <laughs> is, is to find a linear trend in that plot. So, um, so there's questions, you know, densities, uh, average SG, suffice, thicknesses, what area, you know, global areas, net to growth, hate net to growth, V-shale, oh, love V-shale. No, I actually hate V-shale, by the way. Uh, V-shale is an absolutely horrible number to use for CO2 storage, and we can chat about that later. Um, you know, saturations, mass, everything else, there's lots of questions. So, so I, think, I think this transition, I think there's lots of data, um, lots to extract, Shima will do in that. Um, and again, the so what part is really this world. Those capacity estimates are right at the core of the business uh, negotiations that are happening here. Um, and, and then all the other things that we talk about, uh, risk, long-term, you, know, you know, is Andrew Cito Storage Incorporated uh, really going to guarantee perfect containment of, of CO2 in his storage complex so that I as the emitter don't have to bear any of that risk? Um, um, and some of the things we're going to do um, in Aquastore a little bit uh, in this geosafety initiative we're doing is to, to go back and look at this historically now, is go back and, and march through time and see if we can uh, uh, figure some things out. Um, and so, yes, an acknowledgement uh, to the sponsors, an acknowledgement to Energy Simulation for the sports since support since a long time ago, some of the early years that Duke had talked about, I think all the way back to, mm, I'm going to say 2012, we may, oh, no, way before that, actually, yeah, it's a long time, yeah, way before that. So, uh, so thank you all very much, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Whoa, lots of questions and comments. Don't join my company, okay? <laughs> yeah, don't join my company, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the term sheet, I'm not signing. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, Rick, for sharing this impressive real case, this is very important. For yeah. uh, but you didn't talk about much geomechanics, and uh, could you share with us what you think it's the challenges in geomechanics in that kind of project? Of this so type? one of the things that, that, that okay, I'll, I mean, Porshima, I think. So one of the things that Porshima is going to have to worry about here, and one of the worries I've had with Aquastore a little bit, is that there's a whole bunch of things happening in Aquastore that look very good unless you understand the mechanism. So um, we talked a lot about salt precipitation. Salt precipitation always in everybody's minds leads to impairment of injectivity, yet in Aquastore over that first half a million tons, uh, injectivity goes up by an order of magnitude, up. And that's all due to thermal induced fracturing. So I did get you mechanics in. So, but that's the near wellbore phenomena. You cannot get heat, you cannot get heat 2,000 meters away, that's, that's not going to happen. And, and uh, so the mechanics that are leading to sort of thermal induced fracturing that's overcoming any salt precipitation impairment, impairment it's just being swamped by that. Um, and, and so understanding those mechanisms and making sure that people don't sort of look to some of that early performance data, even in your own project, in fact. I mean, you might, uh, you know, this is why we may not believe Andrew Cito Storage Incorporated, right? He takes the first six months of his data and he comes back and says, oh, oh, oh look at this, right? And it's, look at this injectivity. I don't have 120 megatons. I have 400 megatons of storage and so you owe me 60 bucks or something, right? 
So I, I think that's a big one for us, that thermal, I mean, you talked about it even in portos and depleted reservoirs, that thermal response, that's a tricky monster, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. there's a stranger. Hello, Suzanne. Hi, Dr. Chalisternik. Hello, um, <laughs> Suzanne Herter, TNO and University of Queensland. Um, so uh, if I'm uh, Mr. Capacity about to invest the $2 billion, I would then go to Andrew C2 Storage uh, Incorporated and he'd come out, you know, with a 2.65 and says, well, easy, you can put all that down. My question would be, what's your available pressure differential? Mm. And if you're submitting your application and it includes evaluation of what you're doing pressure-wise, if your pressure plume is migrating into somebody else's storage tenement, isn't that what's going to tell you what your capacity is? Yeah. And should we, yes. sorry for your student, bother <laughs> with <laughs> yeah. the um, efficiency so, factor? So I think, um, so just uh, at the beginning of a, a little bit of a road tour of, of a lecturing thing about Aquastore, there was a, a two day thing on efficiency factor. Actually spent, people spent two days talking about efficiency factor in London. And it, I think it was pretty clear that static capacity estimates are good for the atlases, but we're kind of atlased out. Atlases aren't going to help with my, my term sheet, my commercial term sheet with Andrew. So I think somewhere in there, there has to be a recognition of how to actually do this updating of the capacity estimates early on in the, with dynamic data. Like you can get to a certain point, maybe feel comfortable, but he and I are going to have to write something in our term sheets to make sure that, that there's something in there that says I'm going to use that early dynamic data to then um, update my models or do the validation stuff and do forward predictions so that, um, I don't know, Andrew then owes me a lot of money if he doesn't make it to 120 megatons. But the dynamic data needs to get built in. To that. I don't know how that works, but I think there was a recognition that it, it, it has to include that dynamic data. Okay, Rick, here's a question online. Uh, Mohammed Al. Rawahi he says, uh, which efficiency approach you would choose and why would it be different for non limestone versus sandstone? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, sure. It's 2.75% for carbonates. <laughs> no, I'm being cheeky. No, carbonates were way, way more difficult. Way, I mean, I, I think that basal Cambrian stuff, you saw the little white area, when that was for essentially a sandstone. Um, I, I think, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know what number people pick for carbonates. Okay. It's a tricky one, I think. Uh, comment or question I've oh, got. Oh, sorry, so go ahead. Yeah, Daniel Aramburu, Vivian. Uh, coming back to the comment from Susan, uh, how does it work in Canada? Because for storage resources, I guess the static part is not so important. You have to prove it with, with simulation. The, thing, the same thing that happens in oil and gas for reserves, you have to do simulation or uh, decline curve analysis or something that is approved by, sure. by the regulator. So, so this, is, this is the beauty, the easy part of your project. The easy part of your project is that you had, case, you had histor historical data. In many of these cases, the, the, uh, the discussion here now is about pure saline storage. I mean, and so you, you, you don't have that. You don't have any of that. But you can still build at a, a, a dynamic model and, and perform some simulation. And, that, if, and then again, the discussion of the efficiency one factor. One. But my, co my colleague here, my cheap colleague, <laughs> in, in those areas, which are five townships by, you know, more, more, more than that, uh, 15 townships by 50, so 150 kilometers by 150 kilometers, he drilled one well. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. like pure magic, right? That's just, eh, eh. Thing, right? I, who knows, right? So I think that's the challenge at the moment is, is that I think even those static capacity estimates, you, you, you know, regional data, you do what you do. I mean, people do it, right? You've got regional wells, you build a model, you maybe distribute something based on regional characteristics or something, but you know, you know, whether it's an open boundary, semi-closed, closed boundaries, all that, you, pff, I have no idea because he's only done a seven-day test, <coughs> the cheap, cheapo. Um, so yes, you do the simulations, but uh, you, yeah, I, I don't know. A two and a half billion dollar decision on his seven day injectivity test, pretty tough. That's so the problem. Compared to oil and gas, it's like 
making a oil and gas contract, a sales contract with an exploration well. Yes. That, that's, a, that's a perfect analogy. That is, that is almost exactly where it's at right at the moment in terms of those negotiations. And I will tell you that, that I've, it's, uh, having an opportunity now, I think, I, I don't know, eight risk assessments, uh, been involved in eight risk assessments of those projects, and the ability to work with a power producer, not a subsurface person, uh, and listening to those conversations have been phenomenal education. Changes your perspective. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, sure, yeah. I, you don't have to believe. Yes. We are looking at X first, and at some point you go, it, it's, it's an exploration thing initially, yeah? yeah? So when you do an exploration license, so you have to commit yourself to 3D seismic, an, uh, an exploration well, an appraisal uh, performance before you go into this kind of uh, thing uh, you were talking about. So that's not the case in Canada then. No, it, it, it's a timing issue. Uh, yeah, I the, understand the, the timing. The, yeah, the yeah. rails have yeah, come yeah, off yeah, yeah. on I, this on timing. I understand the timing, yes. but, but at some point you have to have something like that in place to make the promise you make, uh, you want Andrew to make. Y yeah? Yes, but, yeah? but, but in order to, so I would say mm -hmm. that, that much like the conversation and, and had, had the topic of Hadji's yeah. conversation, that blue map about mm -hmm. CCS has nothing to do with CO2. No, no, I, I agree. That's hydrogen. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, is yeah. driven almost entirely by hydrogen. Alberta yeah. is making a move towards the hydrogen economy like yeah. crazy, and those blue regions are meant to support the hydrogen yeah. economy, which means these investments are coming tomorrow. I can't, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I would say the other thing maybe for people in the audience is um, the conversation with these separated business models is that these capture entities, these are like cement companies and power producers. What, what, what do they know? Like they, like, what, what do you mean you don't know what the porosity is? Like, you know, I mean, they do, that conversation is just phenomenal to listen to because it's not the same as if you were a subsurface person, right? Yeah. So that's part but, but of it. That's a good point about, you know, an exploration play. That's all you're looking at right now. And then you're kind of hoping for a three to $4 billion investment. But anyway, let's uh, follow up with the other qu question there. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm Sara, a PhD from TU Delft. I understand that the issue of induced seismicity is a topic for the project you discussed. I want to ask you, um, is it occurring right now? And what are the learned lessons if there is issues with induced seismicity in this field or not? Okay, so Thank you. of the current projects for CO2 injection, um, there's only uh, recorded micro seismicity. But in the, in the province, or in Western Canada, uh, if we forego uh, just sort of multi-stage, large-scale hydraulic fracturing operations, large-scale disposal of, of waste fluids are leading to induced seismicity. Not always ground felt, but there have been now uh, a number of that uh, are ground felt in terms of, of that. But in, uh, in that language I said about the um, uh, applications for a sequestration license to inject CO2, there is, there is a requirement, one of the bullet points says, that for your project over its lifetime, you need to address the potential um, for induced seismicity. You have to go through that exercise. So if you're injecting, in some of these cases, um, you know, two, three megatons per year for 25, 30 years uh, into a saline aquifer, you are creating a pressure plume I should say, by the way, that in Alberta, for, for instance, except for maybe some issues around well integrity and, and thing, nobody really cares where the CO2 plume is, with apologies to Susan. If you want to rule a thumb, 25 years of injection, 2,000 meter radius. I don't know how many of these projects I have seen in all of these risk assessments, the CO2 plume, 2,000 meters, pick a number. That's it. You don't need, I don't need any fancy res. I don't need any fancy res in the simulation stuff. <laughs> but the pressure plume, but the, but the pressure plume if for, for our world, monster. The pressure plume like just governs everything. And to remind a lot of people that so, so in your induced seismicity challenges, it really becomes now about how well people 
do the characterization of particular structures in the subsurface, either basement faults or through going or deformation structures. And that prediction of what the pressure plume looks like relative to how those structures sit in the in situ stress field. Those are the, that's the pressure plume, that's the monster. So that's where most people are, are, are focusing their attention. And do you expect um, these um, induced seismic events to remain on the micro seismic scale, or no. do you think it? No, no, there's current evidence that uh, at Giovanni and I saw a presentation by Alberta Geological Survey of some recent analysis of, of large scale. I was mentioning to you earlier the fluid injection. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it will invoke the traffic light. Let me put it just as much as I can. <laughs> Thank, okay. Thank you. Okay, Rick. Um, can I, can I, can so I ask? Well, it's hard not to ask a question. It's, it was a great talk. Really. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you spoke. Just means I said crazy things. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> you, in the answer, a conversation with Sara, you mentioned about pressure. Uh, actually, this is. Uh, I was thinking about there must be, in Andrew's perspective, a kind of a backup plan to manage the pressure. So you could just drill some wells downstream and and produce some brine or lower the pressure yes. and play with it as a backup. That you are not so. <laughs> not <laughs> chance. Not a chance. I mean, if you've, if you've got a project as big as Gorgon, yeah, yeah. and you know the presence of the faults, and you can place pressure management wells in front of faults, which you can do, right, of course. Th this is uh, basal Cambrian sandstones that go from, well, all the way there to way over yeah, there. Um, and so, and so what I'm, I don't even know which direction the plume is going, and I'm, but I'm going to put a straw in. Right. Or yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'd be less optimistic about that. I think what will happen is it will go the other way, Hadri, is that if you've, and I should say for, for those in the seismic side of the world, there is one other risk that's not induced seismic, wherever Sarah went, I don't know where she, where did she go over there, yeah. So it's not necessarily a seismic driven issue. I know, Andrew, I, let me just, I, I'll stop talking here in a second. He's, he's, the the mic is vibrating, I, I know, so, is, is, um, the, a change in the character of the micro seismic events. So you, there's a risk side, and again, this comes from that. So from the risk side, I inject, I'm monitoring, I have J foams, fiber, you know, whatever it is, the magic, and I'm measuring micro seismicity. And we know that that's not a ground motion issue, right? It's a thing. But all of a sudden in your project, if you get the cloud and you're injecting over time, and all of a sudden the, mic, the character of the micro seismicity changes, there is right now a regulatory sort of conversation that says, yeah, okay, that's not going to be a ground fault event, but you need to explain why the character of that micro seismicity has changed. Wow, you can imagine that, how that conversation goes. And so now when you say about the pressure plume, this has now become a subsurface challenge for us to try and be able to predict to a resolution of 100 uh, bars, bars of device, the one to two bar for the European crowd, 100 to 200 kPa resolution on pore pressure prediction 10 kilometers away from your injection well. Right? So but, but we're demanded for it, right? We're demanded now. Okay, Rick, we don't have Academy Award kind of music to pull you off the stage, oh, but, okay. but no, no, stay there, stay there. Oh, okay. My question is, <laughs> I'm gonna change my business plan Okay. It's not going to be saline aquifer. I want to go back to the depleted oil and gas mm -hmm. reservoirs with mm -hmm. Daniel, for example. Mm -hmm. Well prescribed, described the reservoir and whatnot, other than well bore retrofitting, maybe having to do new wells. So would you comment on that being a, being a business opportunity? Um, yeah, they, they may think they're phenomenal targets. They're just not very large. That's sure. There, there, in fact, I think there's, you know, even in even in the blue region, although not a lot of people have started to talk about it publicly, but there are people thinking about that here because they refer to them as um, SSRs, uh, s a small, uh, s small scale and remote SSRs. Um, so that if I'm a local guy and I, I don't want to, I'm not going to spend money with you, and I just want to inject the CO2, I can go to a depleted reservoir and inject. Um, uh, up to, you know, maybe total of two or three megatons or five or something in a, in a thing, but most people are looking at depleted for that. Sure. So capital, capital power wouldn't bet on that one? Well, it's too big. No, I yeah. can't. I'm okay. not for over the long term. Okay. And plus, I, you know, um, you know, I think there's a requirement, you know, but I don't know about the, I forgot about the pr project. I mean, um, 
is that there's more or less a requirement, a bit of a requirement to only bring the pressure back up to original discovery pressure. Right. Not to go above that, right? And so there's, yeah, no, of course, sure. Okay. It works all well, sure. All right, so this draws okay, to a I close. <laughs> thank you, Rick. And thank you for all the audience online. Um, we'll see you tomorrow, but we'll, uh, for the in-person in audience, we'll go to the uh, poster session and networking. Thanks again. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow.